So I had a question about this case, wanted to respond to uh, just basically what were the indications for going ahead and uh, crowning these teeth. Um, well, let's go ahead and look at those. You know, generally, as a general rule, I like to use uh, the treatment that's gonna last the longest and be in the patient's best interest. So sometimes that is a direct resin restoration and that's totally fine. Um, other times it's not. Um, I tend to, like I mentioned uh, in my response to the question, I tend to jump toward a crown a little sooner than I used to. So uh, here's the preparation on this upper left tooth, number 14. And this is the one that I uh, place the pulp cap on and you can see the limelight. So generally what I like to use for my pulp cap procedures, if it's a pulpal exposure um, with actual bleeding and small less than a millimeter, um, I'll treat it with sodium hypochlorite and, and to make sure there's no bleeding. Now, I'm not injecting down into the tooth. I'm basically infiltrating, not infiltrating, but kind of rinsing around the top of the tooth to make sure it's totally sterile. And then assuming I can get the bleeding to stop, um, there's no decay that penetrated um, the pulpal tissue, then I'll go ahead and uh, place limelight if it's totally, totally dry, but I have to treat it with sodium hypochlorite first. So that's my protocol. Now you can certainly use like calcium hydroxide, and I've used that quite a bit in the past, works just fine, but I like to cover it with limelight, which is a light cured resin lining material, it tends to work really well in my hands. Um, so this is the preparation, you can see that deepest portion. Um, let's go ahead and turn on the biocopy. So here's what the tooth looked like before. Now, generally speaking, um, like I mentioned before, I tend to jump toward a crown a little sooner um, than I used to. Now, I realized many dentists would place a direct resin in this situation, and many would place an indirect, maybe an onlay or something like that, and I don't fault any of them for doing that. That's perfectly fine. In my hands, a full coverage crown in this situation is justified for several reasons. Now, I don't think this photo does it maybe as good of a justice as it could, um, but we have a failing amalgam filling, which granted this is a fairly minimal extension, fairly large recurrent decay developing underneath there, some of the corrosion byproducts we can see. A little bit of a facial fracture running down through the through the groove there. But she had some significant decalcification along the gum line and wrapping around. And as I recall, there was interproximal decay as well. So in my mind, here's what my mind is going to do. You know, we have a restoration. Um, we have some decay that's visible, um, some decalcification weakness around the buckle. Um, so as we take that decay out, that restoration is going to end up roughly, you know, this wide. Um, which, if you measure the cusp tip width, which is where I was trained, if we're half the width of that cusp tip width already, the next step is going to need to cover the entire occlusal surface. So logically for me, that next step is to jump into a full coverage restoration. Um, now, whether it's a crown lay or an onlay or a full crown, again, is totally left up to the discretion of the clinician. And again, I wouldn't fault necessarily any dentist for placing a direct resin restoration in this situation. I mean, here's a direct resin, which is obviously already wider than that half the width. Um, so ultimately, that was my rationale for this tooth. Uh, let's see. Let's turn that restoration back on. So there's... The crown, I did smooth this up in post mill processing. Um, let's go ahead and go down to the lower. Turn off the upper. Flip over here. Let's go over there. Okay, so let's look at tooth number 21. Now these are, it's important to note that these are biogeneric copy um, designs. So as I turn on the lower biocopy, and let's turn off the restoration, you can see what that tooth looked like before. Um, kind of ignore that we didn't get the entire tooth imaged. I'm sorry about that, as long as we got the whole occlusal surface. Now, in my mind, this is absolutely justifiable as needing a crown. Um, pretty clear cut case to me. You know, wide silver amalgam filling, extensive ditching, pothole, um, you know, multiple restorations, interproximal decay there. So, a crown logically is the, you know, uh, the next step for me. Now, again, there are many dentists who would have treated this differently, whether it's a partial coverage restoration or an onlay, totally fine. In my hands, a full coverage crown is what I would what I would jump to in this situation. Okay, then let's go back over here um, to number 28. So here's the crown. We'll switch over that, activate that tooth. There's the preparation. And let's go ahead and look at that. So kind of a similar situation to what we had on the upper left. 
um, you know, a restoration which was fairly conservative. Uh, and again, granted, many dentists are going to go ahead and place a direct resin in this situation. But for me, my experience, my training dictates that when I get to a restoration that's going to be wider than half the width of the tooth, you know, it's going to ext it would extend if I was going to do a direct resurrect, <clears throat> excuse me, a direct resin. You know, taking all of this darkness that you see here out to ensure that it's healthy with a mesial marginal ridge fracture, recurrent decay radiographically. Um, once we get that decay out of there, we're going to be roughly this wide. So we're going to be extending up into here. We're going to have a very narrow, thin band of enamel. Um, certainly, we could cover that with a partial coverage restoration. Um, and many dentists would. And, you know, there are some dentists on many of the websites which do beautiful, fantastic, wonderful work. And I don't fault that at all. That's a great choice in their hands. I have no concerns or worries or issues about them doing that. For me, in my hands, again, based on my experience, um, a full crown restoration is indicated here. So let me walk you through my crown prep process um, just so you know you kind of know where I'm coming at as far as my prep is concerned. You know, I like to anesthetize the patient depending on whether or not we're doing biocopy. I'll scan for that biocopy. Um, and generally, I'm mostly worried about, you know, the occlusal and the buccal surface. Um, if there's a partial involved, you know, getting the lingual is important as well. Of course, the lingual on the upper is a little more important than it is on the lower. Um, but then I'll start with, eight, with an 856016. I'm sorry, 856018 uh, super course. I'll do all of my reduction axial and occlusal reduction with that burr. Um, I'll excavate decay with that burr. Once the decay is all excavated um, and verified with a low speed, and usually a size two round burr on the low speed, I'll verify. As you can see, that's probably what we went to here. Then I'll take an 856025, big wide round tipped burr, and go around everything. Smooth and blend. So you can see here on the lingual, I didn't quite get all the way down to the gum line with my prep. I like to try to prep to equigingival, um, but here I didn't quite get down to the gum line. That's fine. Um, many docs keep those super gingival preps and do just fine. Um, anyway, so that's my prep process, and then uh, I end up with these pr pretty smooth margins. This is tends to be a little, you know, a little bit of a challenge sometimes to get real nice, smooth, rounded margins. But I t tend to think uh, that eight five six o two five burr that I use to finish um, helps quite a bit. And I will also, if needed, use that same diamond burr to remove a little bit of the excess gingiva so we get a nice clear image here. Um, anyway, so that's my kind of my thinking, my response to the question, what were the justifications? Um, like I mentioned before, I tend to, a little sooner than I used to, uh, jump toward a full coverage restoration. You know, when I was in school, we always tried to, to do fillings before crowns and what have you, uh, and that's perfectly justifiable, but I'd rather test the tooth as few times as possible um, in hopes of getting a better long-term outcome and lowering the risk of endo. Now, one note about this guy before I let you all off the hook here to go watch somebody else's videos. Um, this guy, I followed up with her uh, that night. I usually try to send my patients a text message just checking in on them, and this tooth was a direct pulpal exposure. The, the amalgam that was underneath it, uh, that was there, was literally sitting on tertiary dentin that was loose in the pulp, uh, pulp chamber. And so taking that amalgam out, and you can see it in the video, <clears throat> I actually exposed the pulp right there and there was bleeding and all that stuff. Um, and so I had a couple of choices, you know, choice one, jump into the endo, which I, in other situations, would have done no problem. Choice two, go ahead and direct pulp cap and uh, see how things go. In this situation, I opted to drag pulp cap. Again, I followed up with her that night, and I had a two-week follow-up with her, I don't know, uh, it's been a, a couple of weeks ago, and she had no symptoms at all. It was a vital pulp, it was a non-carious pulp exposure, it was disinfected, it was covered, um, zero symptoms aside from needing a slight occlusal adjustment uh, several days later. Um, but everything went really, really, really well. And as I look at this, you can kind of see these line angles are a little sharp, so maybe smooth those a little more. <clears throat> but it turned out well, and I'm glad we, we opted to do a, a pulp cap instead of an endo. Um, but in other situations, like I said, I, I would have been fine doing an endo. So there you have it. Um, thanks for the question. Um, always happy to try to answer questions. My schedule changed a little bit today, and so I had a few minutes to respond, so I wanted to give you an update 
But uh, thanks for watching.